together to, uh, to worship the Lord this morning. Would you stand with us? to Emmanuel Baptist Church. We're very thankful that you're here with us this morning. If you're visiting, I'd encourage you to fill out a connect card at the uh, welcome desk after the service and we have a gift for you. Um, and so we're glad you're here especially as well. Um, it is good to see familiar faces as well. So if you're not visiting, we don't have a gift, but I'm glad you're here. Uh, it's a joy to be together this morning and consider God's word and worship together. We've had a busy month at our church. Um, it's hard to believe the church is kind of back to normal. We have a couple of kind of vestiges of, you know, the camps still around. But most of the church is back to normal. Um, and there's been over 200 kids or teens in and through the church hearing the gospel, spending time with our leaders, having conversations at the buses and at the events, um, which is it's an amazing testimony to, to the church and uh, the work of those who volunteered and all the money and effort and donations that were put into it. And so I just want to say thank you. Thank you for all those who put work and money and donations to teen camp and then the kids camp as well, as well as Armstrong. Um, it, it's an insane four weeks of gospel ministry. Our summer staff were exhausted um, and they, they were worn down, but it was good ministry. I think all of them would say they were super thankful and happy to do it and wish they could keep going and do more. 
um, because it was awesome to be united together on mission. Um, I know I felt that and I'm sure and most of them felt that as well. A couple announcements as we begin our service. So uh, next Sunday, there is no Sunday school for the kids or the youth. Everyone is in the service. Um, that's next Sunday. This Sunday, this Sunday, we do have Sunday school for the kids, and then, but the youth are going to stay in the service. Tim's doing uh, a sermon in Proverbs on friendship, and so we thought it would be helpful to have our youth in with us for this Sunday. And then next Sunday as well, after this service, for those who are interested in baptism on the 13th, we're going to have a final meeting um, after the service next Sunday in Pastor Tim's office. And then the baptism Sunday is two weeks away, so August 13th uh, in the evening down at Port Blake Beach. Um, and so we're excited to see, to celebrate new life in those who are getting baptized. Some, some are recent Christians, some have been Christians for a long time, but they're just taking that step of faith. And so we're excited for that time. That's August 13th. And then if you um, are on the church emailing list or on, get our weekly emails, you would have received a statement on biblical sexuality. Um, and genders and marriage and all of those fun topics. And so um, this is, it's a really important statement for our church um, to, to protect us and also to clarify our views and um, what we believe and how we're going to practice. Uh, and so I'd encourage you, if you haven't had a chance yet, to read that carefully. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A night on September 17th. And so just so that we can have conversations about it and everyone can be on the same page and know why we're doing it and, and the purpose um, and then, you know, generate more discussion if we need to have it. That'll be September 17th, and that's on biblical sexuality. If you didn't get the email, fill out the Connect card or send an email to the church. That way you can get added to our email list to get those emails. That's enough of announcements. I, I'm excited to be in God's Word today. So let's go back there. I'm going to read from Psalm 32. Blessed or happy is the, is the one whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. And here's why. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for your grace, your kindness, and keeping us over these last four weeks as much gospel ministry has gone on and for blessing all those who participated. And Father, we're thankful for the ways that you provide and care for each of us individually, the way that you've worked in our hearts and our lives this week. And yet it's so easy to have our minds focused on the here and now, on materials, on needs, on struggles, or on desires, or on successes. It's so easy to forget about Christ and the gospel. And so, Father, we ask now that you would reorient our minds and our hearts towards what you've done through Christ. Would our happiness not be based on the things of this world, not on the material blessings that you've given us, but on the greatest blessing, that is the Son of God dying in our place. And so, Father, we do rejoice this morning. We are happy that you forgive sins because of Christ. And that Christ did say on that cross that it is finished. The work of redemption is done through his death and resurrection. And so we rejoice in Christ. And we ask that as we continue in worship and as we look to your word, you would draw near to us and lift us up from the vain pursuits of this world to eternal glory that awaits us. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Mitch just read, be glad in the Lord. So let's continue to, uh, to do that this morning as we sing, There Is One Gospel. Would you stand?
the back into uh, Sunday school time. Before we uh, take up our offering together, we'll uh, take a moment just to unite our hearts together in prayer. I want to give thanks for three weeks of children and youth ministry and the way God has just reached out to so many kids and youth in this community through the day camps and the youth camp. Uh, I want to thank God also for the baptisms at Cornerstone. Uh, I think there were 11 uh, people baptized at Cornerstone uh, the pa this past week. I want to thank God for those testimonies uh, and that. It was a blessing. And we want to thank God for the rain, right? There are times when in June where we were praying hard for rain, uh, and now we got rain, and we're praying that the rain will stop so that we can have sun. <laughs> But thank the Lord for a beautiful sunrise this morning. Oh, I was taking pictures this morning all over the place. Something about South Huron clouds. Man, oh man, it's just gorgeous. Thank God, right, for that promise of his steadfast love and faithfulness. Uh, when we look around and we see the beauty of God through the beauty of his creation that he put together, right? And we know when we sing about a beautiful Savior, Right? We see that demonstrated all around us in such a real way. And thank God for that. I'm going to turn on my lapel mics because I'm getting a lot of feedback from this one. So, Thank God for the way he provides for us in encouragement. Let's take a moment now to bow our hearts together in gratefulness and prayer. And uh, we'll give thanks for the offering at the same time. Lord, we thank you for your steadfast love and faithfulness toward us. We thank you, Lord, for your name. We thank you that in your name we have salvation. We thank you that in your name we find the grace and strength to persevere. We thank you that it's because of your name, Lord, that you remind us of your beauty. We thank you, Father, reveal, for revealing to us your attributes and what you're like through your word, teaching us who you are and what you've done for us through Christ. Lord, we thank you that we can sing this morning about the cross. From a human perspective, it was an instrument of torture and death. Yet, Lord Jesus, you used it as an instrument of glory and forgiveness and grace to all who will look to what you did on the cross to purchase the forgiveness and give us the right to become children of God. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for rising from the dead to prove that you had the power over death and that we need, no longer needed to be enslaved by our fear of death. You transformed death to make it a, an entryway in a whole, into a whole new kind of life for eternity. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that it's a promise that's not intangible where we'll be floating around on clouds. But we, where we will have the resurrected body similar to the resurrected body of Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we have been created for a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness will dwell and where sin will be absent. And thank you that we have this hope and this promise because of the resurrection. And so, Lord, we come to you in the name of Jesus with our requests and our burdens and our needs. So many, Lord, that are unspoken this morning in our hearts that we long for. Lord, we lay them at your feet. We bring our own sin and brokenness and sorrow, our self-loathing, our despair, and we lay it at your feet, Jesus. We bring it to the cross, and anew and afresh, Lord, we receive your grace and forgiveness 
and hope for the future. Lord, heal us. Lord, restore us. Revive our hearts according to your word. Give us a new and hunger, a new and fresh hunger for your word, Lord. May we receive it this morning with gladness. Lord, humble us to put aside our own agendas, to put aside our own desires, and to respond instead, Lord, to your truth and allow it to shape our future. So, Lord Jesus, give us a a new and fresh love for you and, and a love for what you've done for us through the cross and your resurrection. Through the gospel, the good news of our transformation. And so, Lord, grant us grace this morning to persevere, to allow you to do that good work in us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for our day camps. We thank you for youth camp this past week. We thank you for the baptisms at Cornerstone. We thank you, God, for how you're reaching here in Park through Pastor Josh's ministry there. Thank you for Pastor Aaron and his leadership at Cornerstone. Thank you for the elders that we've sent to these churches, Father, to uh, help them uh, shepherd the people of God. And we pray for them, Lord. Continue to be at work by your Spirit to give them fruitfulness, to grant them perseverance in raising up new disciples, to reaching their communities for Christ. Father, carry them, we pray. Strengthen them this summer. Bless their outreach in the communities that they serve. And Father, just continue to use them and provide for them, we pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to raise up disciples here at Emmanuel. We thank you for our teens and our young adults, Lord, and the the hunger they have to serve you and to give their lives to you. And we pray, Father, that as a church, you would enable us to empower them to do that and to train them to do that. Father, help us all to train in godliness, to train to be on mission, Father, the the harvest indeed is ripe all around us. Thank you for many of the new families that you've been bringing to this community, Father. Thank you for their hunger for you and their desire to connect into a community of faith. And Father, we pray that you would be help, help us be faithful with the people that you send to us. Help us to love our neighbors and share your gospel with them. Lord, we commit this offering to you now this morning and pray that you would use it for your honor and glory and for the continued work of this church reaching this community and uh, the county of South Huron. Father, may you be glorified through our giving and through our ministry. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. this time I'll invite the ushers forward.
Let's take a moment to ask God to prepare our hearts now to receive his word. Father, we thank you for the privilege of looking into your word, to receive your direction, to hear your voice speak to our hearts, teaching us and training us to live lives of wisdom. Thank you, Lord, that you don't leave us alone to try to bring our lives into conformity to your word and our own strength, but thank you that you give us your spirit that enables us to respond to you. Thank you for your grace that strengthens us to obey your word. And so, Lord, anew and afresh, we humbly bow at your feet and ask that you would give us wisdom and understanding that you would give us the grace to obey what we hear and apply it to our lives wherever we're at God keep me from saying anything that's not in keeping with your truth help me to be a faithful steward of what you've entrusted to me in your word and so Father we leave this to you and pray that you would speak. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1994, uh, a pop group called the Rembrandts, because, you know, I can't let go of this Rembrandt thing. And <laughs> this pop group called the Rembrandts wrote a song for a TV sitcom that became the staple for millennials growing up. Uh, through the 90s when they were reaching their 20s. And the title of that song, some of you might recognize it, I'll Be There For You, right? And so the sitcom, of course, was Friends. Uh, and it was watched by millions of coming-of-age millennials struggling to survive in the real world and find companionship and comfort and support through friendship. And uh, I don't know, how many of you would be in that group called the Millennials, who you would have been in your 20s in the 1990s. Raise your hand. Any of you here? So just Mike. Okay, thanks, Mike, for coming. Um, this sermon is just for you, so it's good you're sitting at the front. <laughs> that generation of young people, for them, you know, loyalty and friendship really became more important than anything else in the world. And much of their thinking around friendship and loyalty was focused on what they learned and were taught through culture, and in particular, how culture was shaped by this sitcom called Friends. It's amazing how culture shapes us, isn't it? Uh, and that, that loyalty was unbelievable. It became a greater loyalty than family. And so your friends, if you were growing up as a millennial at that time, were more important than anybody, any advice you would ever get from your family. Friends became more important than any kind of loyalty or advice you would get from your church. Friends were the ultimate place where you could find security and, you know, guidance in life and, you know, some idea where to go in the future so much of uh, the millennial culture was shaped through their friendships. Now, sadly, with the show Friends, it sexualized the idea of friendship uh, in a very unbiblical way uh, and perverted the idea in some ways. Nonetheless, the popularity of the show reminds us of this inborn instinct, I think, that we all have, not only millennials, but that we all have to want to have personal relationships with other people and to be able to know them as close friends. We love spending quality time with our friends. We all truly believe, whether we realize it or not, and we practice the concept of the television series, you can never have enough friends. We all have casual acquaintances, but for many of us, we're blessed enough to be able to have a few close friends who become important, more and more important to us as the years go by. In significant ways, our lives become intertwined with our close friends. 
and we walk through life together. The Bible actually exalts these kind of friendships. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, it says there, two are better than one. We oftentimes apply this to marriage, but it applies as well to friendship. Uh, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. And then in the book of Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. And of course, this proverb suggests that brothers, you know, brothers in our families are a means for protection, right? You have a big brother, and they kind of watch over you and protect you, and they're obligated by that family relationship to be there for you. But the difference is, a friend actually chooses you. When someone loves you at all times, even in the good and bad, even though they don't have to, that kind of person is a true friend. So this and other passages throughout the Proverbs suggest we, we need to learn the discipline of building small groups of people around us that we can walk through life with. People who will encourage us and comfort us and correct us and teach us how to try again when we fail. Proverbs actually offers a lot of advice, interestingly enough, when it comes to wisdom about how to choose friends and the right kind of friends that we should walk through life with and the ones we shouldn't. Uh, And so Proverbs is a powerful book in that it teaches us right from the get-go, especially those of you who are teens this morning, Proverbs was written actually just for you. It's giving you some advice this morning on how to start off into life the right way, and that right way starts with being able to choose friends to walk with you. The right kind to choose and the wrong kind to learn to avoid. And so choosing friends is the po- first point this morning. In Proverbs thirteen twenty, we read, he who walks with the wise, and walks is, is French for hangs out and does life with. He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. In other words, we need to be very careful who we choose as friends. Generally speaking, as Proverbs says, if you choose a wise friend, you'll become wise. You choose a foolish friend, and you will come to harm. The implication of this proverb is that on all kinds of different levels, close friends are deeply connected, way more connected than what we would realize. And over time, close friends or at least the close friends around us, we begin to share their values. We exchange, there's an exchange of values that takes place uh, by virtue of that close friendship. We take on theirs, they take on some of ours. We start to share convictions, morals, as well as habits and goals. So friendship is important because it can influence you in a super positive way, because of that exchange of beliefs and values and morals and goals, or it can also play in a negative way. And they pass back and forth between friends, whether we realize it or not. The end result being that we can be deeply affected by either the wisdom or the foolishness of our friends. Now, the positive side of all this is that we can enhance our chances of growing in wisdom and growing in a positive direction by choosing the right people to become friends with. In Proverbs 27, 17, we read, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And uh, and those of you who know anything about skinning beavers, Dean, 
we're brothers, right, in that. But if you want a super sharp edge on a knife, you don't use a grinding stone. You use a knife steel. So you, first of all, you do the, the, the big work with the grinding stone to get the proper angle on your blade. But if you want a really sharp edge, pull out your knife steel, right? And we see, of course, chefs use that all the time. They do the shling, 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 and never cut their arms off. I don't know how, but they don't. But iron sharpens iron in a very specific and fine and refined way. This is how the writer of Proverbs describes the influence of friends with friends. We can either have our character sharpened by a good friend or made dull and useless by a bad one. Their distortions of truth can undermine our understanding of God and its ways and make us insensitive and dull to the things of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, the Apostle Paul writes, listen, don't be misled. Don't be fooled. Bad company corrupts good character. And then at the end of it, he writes, that's the facts, Jack. That's in the Greek. So, you know, you don't read that. In the, I'm joking. Bad company corrupts good character. You know, and I find it uncanny how people with broken lives can oftentimes trace the beginnings of the unraveling of their lives to the choice they made to forge early on in their lives a close friendship with somebody whose life was ruled by foolishness and foolish decision making. So the truth of the matter is this, we become like the people we choose to be close to. We become like the people that we choose to be closest to. And so that's why it's important early on in our lives we make some good and healthy choices about the friends that we gather around us. But it also applies to later in life as well, right? You can make a shipwreck at the end by choosing bad friends as well. So having said that, what kind of person do you want to become? When I talk about becoming like the people we choose to be close to, I'm not necessarily talking about issues of personal lifestyle or talents, right? So, you know, I want to learn how to play the violin better. I'll hang around with violin players. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about issues of integrity and character. The things we oftentimes can't see deep down in the heart. These are the things that matter the most to God. And if we want to grow in the areas that we have discussed so far in our series through Proverbs like wisdom and integrity and discipline, then we need to intentionally surround ourselves with people who will manifest those qualities coming out of their lives, manifest what's in their hearts coming out. The flip side of this is we should intentionally avoid becoming close friends with people who don't show these kind of characteristics. So Proverbs 22, verse 24, gives you a good example of this. And we talked about uh, anger a little while back, right? Don't make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with somebody who gets angry and flies off at every chance they get. Now, don't get me wrong. By saying that, I don't mean that, you know, people who struggle with these things don't matter to God. They do. And I'm also saying they should matter to us. We should use every opportunity to touch the lives of people who struggle with brokenness and sin in their lives. To be kind to them, to serve them, to love them and point them to Christ. But they are not the people we should invite to walk closely with us through life. Why? Because we have a tendency to catch bad habits. Right? People that, people that we surround ourselves with and get intimate with as friends shape us and influence us. So having clarified this, Proverbs gives us insight 
into some of the characteristics we should look for in choosing the friends that we want to walk through life with. And we're going to look at that now. Two characteristics, or sorry, characteristics of a true friend. And the first one is a true friend is loyal. Proverbs 17:17 17, 17, that we quoted at the beginning, a friend loves at all times. In one of Aesop's fables, the story is told of two travelers who are on the road together when a bear shows up uh, on the scene. And before the bear saw them, one of the men made for a tree at the side of the road and climbed up into the branches and hid there in the tree. But the other friend couldn't run as fast, and uh, that's always how it goes, right? Always, you know, if you ever want to be saved, you just got to run faster than the person that's next to you. Uh, anyway, he couldn't escape, so he throws himself down onto the ground and does the I'm a dead guy thing, which works, you know, I'm told works fine, you know, with some bears and doesn't work with others. So you've got to kind of know which bear it's going to work on before you do that. that. So the bear, anyway, as the fable goes, you know, found, you know came up to the guy and started sniffing around him. And um, the guy, of course, just, I don't know how he did it, but he held his breath and, you know, stayed stiff and nothing happened. The bear actually took him for a corpse and went away. Then when the coast was clear, the guy in the tree came down and asked the other guy what it was that the bear seemed to have whispered into his ear uh, before he left. And the other guy replied, he told me to never again travel with a friend who deserts you at the first sign of danger. Um, and of course, the whole point of the, the fable was, you know, true friends stick with us even when the going gets tough. They take the good and the bad with no strings attached. Many so-called friends are close as long as the booze and the good times keep coming. Proverbs 19.6 says, Everyone is a friend of a man who gives gifts. You know, some friends are like that, right? They're only there when times are good. When things go bad for us, we go through tough times. They disappear. Proverbs 26 says, Many a man proclaims his own steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find. A true friend loves at all times. A true friend's loyal. A true friend's loyal but not blind. Right? We need to qualify that in some ways, and other Proverbs do. The balance of Proverbs teaches us with regard to friendship that we need to have boundaries uh, on that loyalty. And so we see the second point is that a true friend's honest, right? A true friend doesn't only just tell us everything that we want to hear and say encouraging and nice things, but a true friend also is there for us when we need the truth. And so when we talk about honesty, I don't mean only that a, a true friend never tells lies. That's important for friendship. That's important for any relationship. But one of the characteristics of a true friend in Proverbs is that they have the courage and honesty to sometimes tell us what we don't want to hear. So Proverbs 27, 6 says, Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy will actually multiply kisses. In other words, compliment you all the time and be nice all the time. And the implication of this verse is that when we surround ourselves with people who only tell us what we want to hear, they're not really our friends. Real friends speak the truth when the truth is hard to swallow. Real friends expose our blind spots. And we all have those, don't we? It doesn't matter who you are. We all have blind spots, things in our own lives that we're just, we just can't see. We're blind to them. It's like, you know, you pull up to the intersection and there's just a little piece of <laughs> the, inch, the windshield uh, or the support for the windshield that masks oncoming vehicles. And when you, if you happen to, by chance, look that way at the same time that a car is in that blind spot, what will happen? You'll pull out in front of a vehicle. 
And, and so we all have those kind of blind spots in our lives, things that we do and say that we can't see ourselves doing and saying. And we need friends to sharpen us and teach us about those aspects of our character that we're blind to. The difference between a, a wound from a friend and a wound from an enemy is that the wound from a friend is gracious and it's designed to actually build us up and help us and not tear us down. An enemy's wounds tear us down and often are designed to make us feel inferior and build them up in their own eyes in the context of an unbalanced, an unequitable friendship. Proverbs 27, 9 says, Perfume and incense bring joy to the heart. I'm not an incense fan. I'm not a big fan of perfume either. But, you know, generally speaking, you know, for some people, it brings joy to their heart. And then it says, The pleasantness of one's friend springs from his earnest counsel. And the idea there is that earnest counsel is a, a sweet fragrance, right, that, that brings joy. And so i got to admit, I do like fruity soaps. That's out there, okay? It's now been put out on the internet, and everybody's going to know it. Don't send me fruity soaps, though. Please, don't do that, because, you know, <laughs> I can't believe I just said that out loud, but there it is. Yeah, I'm just kind of being vulnerable here. But it, it's like fragrance that brings joy to us, like smelling strawberries or fresh-cut grass, Right? Counsel from a friend builds us up. Look for a friend then who in humility and grace will tell you what you don't want to hear when you need to hear it. Right? Timing's everything. How we approach it's everything if we're on the giving end. But if we're on the receiving end, sometimes there are times when we need to have our blind spots exposed in a gentle and gracious way. But avoid friends who will, you know, provide excuses for their bad behavior. Proverbs 22.10 says, Drive out a scoffer, and strife will go out, and quarreling and abuse will cease. We've got to be able to recognize scoffers when they come into our lives who mock God and mock everything that's right. And Scripture says, drive them out. Don't ever have anything to do with people who love to argue and abuse you emotionally through their words and through their actions. Thirdly, a true friend's forgiving. In Proverbs 17, 9, we read, He who covers over an offense promotes love. But whoever repeats the matter to others separates close friends. Proverbs 10, 12, hatred stirs up dissension and fighting, but love covers over all wrongs. A true friend is someone who's committed to peacekeeping, keeping short accounts in their relationships, teaching us to value making things right when we hurt others, intentionally or unintentionally. And this is probably one of the most important aspects that we can learn of true friendship. You know, a true friend has the grace to overlook our idiosyncrasies and, and sometimes our boneheadedness, which we all struggle with, but also has the courage to confront us when we need to be and when we've crossed that line. And of course, wisdom is part of knowing when and when not to, right? And so we have that, that one proverb that seems to contradict itself when it says, you know, Rebuke a fool, and he'll hate you for it. And then it says, you know, rebuke a fool, and he'll love you. I can't remember even now what the reference is, and that's probably a misquote. But it seems contradictory, but what it's saying is, there's a time when it's right to rebuke a fool, and there's a time when it's not a good idea. And wisdom comes in knowing the right time. And so we pray for that kind of wisdom that teaches us when to rebuke a friend and when to let it go out of love. And so oftentimes, you know, it's so easy to talk about 
when we've been hurt by others rather than to actually confront the person and put that hurt to bed. True friends will follow the biblical pattern of resolving a conflict by talking to one another about sin rather than talking to others about it. And so Matthew 18, 15 to 17, Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. And if he listens to you, you have won your brother over. True friends are loyal and they're honest and forgiving and committed to working through relational conflicts quickly. And so for that reason, you'll see number three, friendship takes work. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of work. You know, don't entertain the illusion this morning that, you know, that you'll be sitting around your house and all of a sudden you'll hear a knock on your gar- door and there's three people who want to be your friend. <laughs> hey, we were just thinking about it. We want to be your friend. That's not going to happen usually, right? And if it's happened, it's probably because you won the lottery and you should probably be locking your door, not opening it. That's not how, not how friendship works. It, it takes work. We each need to take initiative to surround ourselves with godly people and, and make the effort of getting close to them. You know, the danger is it's, it's just too, it's, it's so easy sometimes to stay with the status quo. You know, I got this group of friends, you know, or I got, you know, this family and, and you know, I'm not going to risk making new friends because that's just scary. And, and I like the security that I'm feeling right now. But the reality is we, we need to continually be making new friends. And by the way, now I'm speaking to those of you who are gray-haired or hairless as myself. What happens the older you get? Well, you know, we all have to face the reality that the older you get, the more your friends kind of disappear. They move or they die or circumstances change. And as you grow older, you need to learn this discipline probably more than young people, how to make new friends. And, but the, what's the challenge to that as you grow older? As you grow older, you grow more cynical about friends, right? You've been burned lots in life, and so there's this tendency as we age to become isolated because we're afraid of making new friends, because we know, and sometimes it's because like, well, if I, <laughs> if I make that friend, they're just going to die. <laughs> do you ever wake up saying that? I did once. I did once. And I said, Lisa, smack me. But it's what happens, right? The older, and I'm not even old. <laughs> the tendency is to think in those kind of cynical ways, right? If I make another friend, wow, well, they're just going to betray me. Or they're going to move or they're going to, you know, something's going to happen to them. And so as we get old, there's this tendency to kind of step away from taking the risk of making new friends. And, and we've got to lean into that uh, tendency to do that and fight against it. We need to be willing to make that first move. So introduce yourself, shake hands, begin conversations. Invite people out to lunch or breakfast. You know, in the end, you can't force people to be your friend. And you know, Proverbs reminds us that in order to have friends, you've got to like, be a friendly person, right? And so work on your friendliness, but you can't force people to be your friend, but you, you can open as many doors as possible uh, for God to lead you to the right person. And my prayer is that God will enable every one of us here this morning to experience the blessing and enrichment that godly friends can bring into our lives. And this is, I mean, it, this is timely. It's timely for me, but I think it's timely for all of us because we're at a, a, um, a, a time in our church culture, right, where we've planted a couple of churches and we've created all kinds of empty seats and there's all kinds of new folk coming in and filling those seats. And the tendency traditionally in, in, you know, in an established church like this is for the folk that have always been here to always just kind of have their own gang and always hang out with their own gang because they're familiar and comfortable with them. And, and, the, and the tendency is, you know, to 
all of a sudden, you, you know, everybody's just kind of sitting in this area, and then new people sit over here, and, you know. And nobody wants to take the risk of creating new friendships. And so we're at that place where we've got to, you know, wrestle with this personally. Am I going to step outside of my comfort zone and my traditional circle of friends and make new friends uh, with the folk that God brings here? And so that's my challenge to you, to do that. To, you know, to invite somebody you don't know out for breakfast that you meet this morning for the first time or the 15th time. You know, and, and don't be afraid, you know, if you come up to a new person and say, hey, <laughs> nice to meet you, are you new here? Probably don't ever ask, are you new here? Because you're going to find out that they've been going here for three or four years and then you'll be embarrassed. I get that all the time. So leave out the, are you new here question. Yeah, just, just be glad that they're here. Uh, but yeah, we're at this place, right, where we have to kind of now get to know one another again because it's really 50% of the church is turned over. Uh, you know, and, and God will keep bringing new people here because that's, that's what he does when a church faithfully preaches the gospel, um, you know, and, and when a church is faithful in doing discipleship. I think, I don't, I forget what, who said this, but, you know, uh, it was a pastor at some point said, you know, God won't send you, like, new little babies unless the incubator's warm, right? And, and so churches have to be this place of warmth and discipleship and you know, growth in order for God to send people to them. And, and God has been sending us lots of new folk and new Christians and, and visitors, you know, and our responsibility is to embrace them and take those friendship risks and reach out to them. And we do it because, fourthly, Jesus is the ultimate friend. Even though we've been extolling the virtues of true friendship, we need to realize that ultimately, human friends disappoint us. They let us down. I mean, we're going to let each other down at one point or another. I know I have multiple times. I'm just thankful for your patience with me. But we do. We disappoint each other. We're human. We're broken. We struggle, right? It's why we can't let our security rest solely in our human relationships. You know, that, that's what happened to many millennials in the friends generation. They made friendship the ultimate thing and rested their security on those friendships, right? Well, that's going a little too far because ultimately people let us down. But there is one friend who will never betray us or let us down, and that is Jesus Christ. The place to start in searching for true friendship is in a relationship with God through Jesus he is the friend that will never betray you or let you down. John 13, 1, as Jesus gathered his disciples around him prior to the crucifixion, the apostle John writes, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. Even though, remember, all his disciples betrayed him at the crucifixion. Peter, who himself had proclaimed his loyalty to Jesus three times, Lord, even though all these loser disciples here, John especially, desert you, I never will. And then what did he do? He denied Jesus three times. But in spite of Peter's failure, Jesus still loved him. And we know the rest of the story, thank God, right? He appears on the shores of the Lake of Galilee. Jesus takes the initiative to reach out to his friends, the ones who betrayed him, and Peter. And he calls to them from the shore, inviting them back into friendship and intimacy. That's a beautiful picture, right? Cook some, you know, what, what a way into a man's heart. Cook him breakfast, you know? Seashore breakfast, even better, right? After a long day of fishing, <laughs> and Jesus reaches out and says, hey, yo, come and have breakfast, guys. You look tired. And so he reaches out to them. And there Jesus reaffirms his commitment to Peter. And he recommissions him. How many times? Three times. And I think, you know, Peter gets the message. Yeah. I can't out-betray a friend who loves me and has given himself for me. And he says, Peter, go feed my sheep, man. I still love you. 
I still believe in you. And you're still my man. You're my rock. Go. Feed my sheep. That's true friendship. Total acceptance. Total forgiveness. A friend who knows who you really are and doesn't walk away. And Jesus is the ultimate friend that we all need. I hope you know that. I hope you've owned that friendship as yours this morning. But he's also a pattern, right, of how we need to learn to befriend others. Show them the love of Christ and walk with them in wisdom. May God grant us the grace to do that in the coming days. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us wisdom in our friendships through the book of Proverbs. Thank you, Lord, for your Proverbs that give us different perspectives on friendship to teach us how to make wise decisions in choosing our friends. And so, Lord, give us your wisdom to protect us from foolish friendships and to give us a desire and a hunger to cultivate godly ones. And God, you teach us all the the subtleties and the nuances that we haven't had time to talk about this morning that surround that. God, teach us by your Spirit to apply wisdom to how we cultivate friendships and how we become a good and godly friend. And so, Lord, we commit this to you and thank you. In Jesus' name. As we close this morning, would you stand with us and let's uh, sing together again. It was finished upon that cross.
Lord, we thank you that it was finished upon the cross, that we can look to the cross for grace and strength to help in our time of need, to be good and faithful friends, and to choose faithful friends. Father in heaven, we pray that you would grant us wisdom in these things in the days to come. And we thank you that we can look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, to bring to completion that good work which he's begun in us until the day of Jesus Christ. And so we look forward to that day. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace.